Thank you, Linda, and hello, everybody. Um, welcome to today's webinar, Achieving Secure Digital Transformation in Manufacturing. Uh, we think we have some great kind of content and uh, that you'll really enjoy. We've got participation here from a number of our partners and customers, as you will see. Um, let me just go over the agenda quickly. Um, I'm gonna do a little bit up front. We wanna get to the meat of the uh, webinar just to talk about trends and put things in context. Um, and in terms of achieving secure digital transformation, we're gonna show you a glimpse of the future here today um, with the Deloitte Smart Factory. So I'll talk about trends, context, we'll get a glimpse of the future, what's possible both with digital transformation and with secure cyber protection. And then we're gonna turn it over to have a panel discussion. Um, and you'll hear from our panelists that are um, living this today and kind of the challenges they face as they go through their digital transformation. And wrap it up with um, a, an overview of new capabilities in the Dracos platform. So trends, glimpse of the future with the smart factory, panel members talking about kind of where they are in this digital transformation, the challenges they face. And we're gonna wrap up and talk about how you can address those challenges with the Dragos platform. So to kick it off, um, talking about trends uh, generally, but also directly in manufacturing. Manufacturing um, industry 4.0 is a huge initiative often referred to in the context of digital transformation, transforming, transforming operations by connecting everything, getting data, getting smart, making things better, more efficient. Um, and so there's enormous benefits to the connectivity that's being um, uh, put in place to achieve this digital transformation. But at the same time, I think as we all realize, when you do that, you're increasing the risk exposure. Now that everything is connected, you, you're exposed to malicious cyber threats. Um, in Dragos, we, we track the threat landscape um, uh, with our, our team of uh, ICS practitioners and Intel people and put out an annual report um, each year in the 2020 year in review. Um, we reported that threat groups are actually uh, increasing and that they're rising about three times faster than they are declining. Um, and we see threats in the head, um, attacks in the headlines, which kind of just shows kind of proof of the increased risk and exposure. So that's kind of the context. It was this balance, uh, need to balance investment in digital transformation with the investment in securing uh, those digital operations. But this is an interesting statistic from the uh, Manufacturing Leadership Council that Dragos is a part of, which is part of the National Association of Manufacturers. Um, and this is part of an annual survey that they do on transformative technologies asking the respondents, how do you assess the challenges related to adoption of these transformative technologies? And you can see the results point out that 85% say cybersecurity challenge is high to medium in terms of their ability to adopt and use transformational technology, which is quite significant. So the challenges are big and real. And, um, the opportunity is also big and real. And so I'm gonna turn it over now to Jimmy Asher from uh, Deloitte. He's a senior manager there of supply chain and manufacturing operations, who's gonna give us a glimpse of the future here today in the Deloitte Smart Factory. Jimmy. Peter, thank you for the introduction. Um, when, when we think about the Smart Factory, um, there's a number of different initiatives that are in place. We go ahead and advance to the next slide, Peter. So Industry 4.0 has several different aspects within inside of it. Um, a lot of times manufacturing often thinks about reinforcing a repeatable process, but along with that can often be disruption. And if we think about Industry 4.0, it's embracing that disruption at the heart of it. So dealing with different sources of data, connectivity to assets that may not have been possible before. When we look at that, often we frame the business use case around those transformations in improved asset efficiency. So incremental increases in capacity um, that allows better throughput or a cost reduction through um, improved quality um, as another metric. Oftentimes we looked at 
um, agility. So bring in new products to market and how they can be affected. And sustainability is oftentimes um, a component as well too. So if we think about not only the safety of our employees um, and practices, but the sustainability from a global aspect and how all of those work together. Now, when you do that and you start to leverage different um, data sources, you have to go through several different considerations. And it's important to understand how those might come to life with inside of a manufacturing facility. So we've, we've put together the Smart Factory at Wichita. Go ahead and advance to the next slide. It, think of the, the Smart Factory at Wichita as half of a working factory and half of an experience park. The intent is a 60,000 square foot facility that brings together that data disruption and embraces con, con, uh, continuing manufacturing in ways that oftentimes are not seen. So the facility is a working factory that'll be make, manufacturing a STEM education kit that will donate to different areas. One of the parts that makes it somewhat unique with inside of the space and, and energizes me drastically is um, the ecosystem that's enabling different technologies. So companies such as Drago's participating, also one of the panelists service now participating with inside of that ecosystem and bringing various different technologies to life and showing the, the collaborative solutions that can be realized with inside of Smart Factory. A couple of renderings on the page that you can see. Um, see the, the manufacturing line on the left-hand side. Note again, sort of that working factory, but with that area of experience park above it on the second floor where you can get a bird's eye view down on the factory. Um, so you get not only the factory floor view, but view from above and an integral um, command center I'll talk about in a second. There's also some experience rooms that we go through. In the picture on the top row, um, that's an area that we call the today space. And, and inside of that area, we frame common pain points that happen with inside of manufacturing, whether that might be availability of resources or quality or capacity constraints. The bottom two pictures are um, that command center control room. So it perches, perches over top of the smart factory line looking at with a bird's eye view. And then on the other side is a digital wall that's about 25 feet. So there's a combination of digital experience, data flowing from various different solutions, fully connected manufacturing stack from ERP down to the manufacturing line that's all enabled by different solutions. We go to the next slide. So, when we often think about um, those solutions, there's a lot of data connected from um, plant or IoT solutions, right? Traditional OT and um, new emerging areas in IoT. We have a combination of those solutions with inside of the smart factory at Wichita. Dragos is one of our partners that's playing with inside of that space and allows us to bring to life various different solutions on OT and IT monitoring looking at digital asset management and how the life of those assets on the factory floor are producing um, SOC capabilities and incident response and how we alert and escalate different functionality with inside of it. With that, I'll pass it back to you, Peter. Great, <laughs> thank you, Jimmy. And just to add, just to add in the smart factory uh, at Wichita, uh, we're, Dragos is partnering with Infor, who's another one of the founding um, sponsors of the fart smart factory. And you'll uh, see how we're integrated into the experience there. These use cases that you see on the slide that Infor supports, Dragos is, is supporting. Infor shows you information about assets, the state of the plant, overall equipment effectiveness. And Dragos brings more to that picture with the health of the dig digital assets that are controlling that equipment, including uh, asset visibility, bone management, and threat detection. And you saw some cool slides from Jimmy. This is what the Infor garage uh, will look like where Dragos will be participating. And thanks very much to Infor for the partnership we have with them. So with that, now we're going to turn to, so you saw, you know, I talked a little bit about the trends in the industry. 
increasing investment in transformation, hyperconnectivity, the risk and exposure that uh, can come from that, and kind of really the need to balance the investment between the two. Jimmy showing us a, a glimpse of the future here today of some of the distinct possibilities um, that um, are possible. And we're going to now turn to our panelists and have our panelists uh, talk about the challenges they see in the industry, which are not all in the future. They're here today. And um, to uh, run the panel session, we're going to have our the Dragos uh, CISO, our own Steve Applegate. Steve is an industry veteran CISO. He's not a sales rep in disguise. And uh, he comes from industry having worked at Marathon Petroleum, PepsiCo, Saudi Aramco. So he is a real um, a, a veteran. And I'll turn it over to Steve. He can introduce our panelists and, and take over from here. Thanks. Thanks for the intro, Peter. Yeah, I'm really excited to be here today. These are just vitally important topics, uh, especially with this like ever accelerating digital revolution that we all find ourselves living through. I'd also like to thank the panelists. Um, I know life as a cyber executive is hectic and for you to take time today is really important for us. And, and uh, I wanna thank you for that. It's, it's, it's key to hear you know, your, from your own personal experiences and, and to contribute to these type of conversations. So I guess let's start with some brief introductions. Fran, would you take a minute to tell us a little bit about yourself, your background and kind of the role you're in and everything? I guess I gotta go off mute, okay. Uh, I'm Fran Shafi. I'm the CISO at Georgia Pacific. Um, what you might think is Georgia Pacific's a railroad. It's not. We are the major manufacturing of building products, cellulose products, packaging products, and consumer goods. Uh, GP has grown over the years through acquisitions, which has introduced a tremendous amount of what I would say um, variation in our environment. So, you know, when we look at Dragos and some of the investments we're going to be making in, um, in IT and, and cybersecurity, this is a key part of that, to change what we've done in the past and, and migrate us into the future. All right, thanks for that, Fran. Uh, Jeremy? Hi, I'm Jeremy Corger, and I suspect, like many of you, I uh, get to wear a lot of hats on any given day, but one of the most critical and interesting parts of my job is I get to lead the OT cybersecurity practice at SubZero Group, uh, where I'm a manufacturer of high-end appliances for the home. Uh, but I did also spend several years at an electrical utility and working in the OT cybersecurity space for power generation and distribution. And for me, it's been really interesting to see the similarities and differences of those different OT environments and the differences in the industries between manufacturing and utilities. Absolutely. And thanks for that, Jeremy. And last but not least, James. Yeah, I am James Destro. I'm the head of product for the manufacturing vertical at ServiceNow. Uh, my team is responsible for taking existing ServiceNow products and building manufacturing specific products on top of those. And we've recently launched our operational technology management product suite, uh, which is what some of the context that we'll be talking about today. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, so just prep and prep for this today, I was thinking about similar panels and webinars that, that I was a part of, or I, I watched years, just not that long ago, honestly, just a few years ago, where we were hearing the need for digitization is coming, uh, the impacts to the bottom line are here, you know, we, if we're going to remain competitive in the world, we're going to have to go enter the digital revolution. Um, and now here we are just a few years later, um, and we're living in the reality of this industry 4.0. And in some ways, it seems like the security executives are trying to pick up the pieces in terms of security. Um, there used to be a lot more naysayers than what we're seeing today because of, you know we, we would warn about the risks to come when you interconnect and, and try to factor in you know, the, the costs of doing business from a security perspective. And now it seems like that the arguments have changed. You know, we, we don't hear a lot of the same kind of arguments anymore with all the stuff we've seen in the recent news with solar winds, Oldsmar, Colonial Pipeline, Casilla, all this type of stuff. So first question to the panelists, you know, do you feel like now we can kind of put the business case for cyber behind us a little bit and we can kind of re reevaluate and refocus our efforts onto other things, these major challenges like visibility and situational awareness, uh, vulnerability management and stuff like that? Or do you feel like we're still fighting in a fight to justify what we're doing? Um, I, let's, I guess we might as well go in order. I guess, uh, Fran, if you want to kind of take a first stab at that one. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, cyber, it's, it's an integral part of everything we do nowadays. I think we've crossed that bridge a while back. Uh, when you think about 
all of the recent news attacks of cyber attacks in the in the uh, in the industry right now it's gotten everyone's attention so our advanced manufacturing trans transformation initiatives cyber is built in up front it, it's not something that we have to push anymore it's really something that our executives our leadership team our engineering teams uh, they realize they have to build in cyber up front we can't put in transformational uh, initiatives within the organization and make those investments without cyber being uh, an integral part of that. And then from, uh, from my perspective, we, we definitely have a good cybersecurity you know, presence in our organization, but I can imagine there's a lot of organizations on the phone here who maybe aren't that as advanced in it. So, you know, it's, it's a matter of kind of balancing out. You don't want to scare people. The FUD slides of, you know, all these breaches are important to educate, but we're not trying to scare people into this. So I think where you are in this journey can really affect whether or not you need that business case, helping people understand it, but just making it real for your organization and understanding that's the key step. I think from, from my perspective, as we start to see, you know, it, for new initiatives, new rollouts, and, and let's call it kind of greenfield overall transformation initiatives, I agree, cyber's by design. What we are experiencing, however, is there is a tremendous amount of brownfield capabilities, especially around operational technology, where it wasn't there by design. And this isn't transformational technology, like in the IT space that changes every one to two years. These systems have been in place for five to 10 years. Uh, and as part of that, we do need to go back and actually look at what are some of the ways that we need to look at some of these legacy assets, especially as we turn to how to secure them, how to bring them into what we call the workflow space and how to do service on top of them. Uh, very good. Yeah, I think I, I identified with everything that all three of you said. It seems like I've seen some of the old arguments kind of get put to bed. And it seems like we have new arguments. We have a whole spectrum, like Jeremy was saying, depending on the company, depending on you know which industry you're in. And uh, absolutely, OT equipment, the risks are different. And even seems like that we're, there's, there's not as much um, art to it. It's more science. You know, we have to the deterministic protocols. You got to keep things running all, all the time. And it changes the, the, the way that we think about risk a little bit. Um, so with all this exposure, you know, this increased exposure to critical assets that uh, is just an integral part of digitization, um, how have you changed your approach to OT risk management? That's, that's uh, you know, at this point, again, it's changed. The way that we used to do risk management whenever we had air gap, we could say there's no reason why this ever has to touch something. You know, we, we called it our crown jewels and we tried to sever any connection. I know it was a little bit of a myth that it could be air gap because of patch management and because of just other ways of needing to get data in and out of it. But how, what has that done to the way that you handle it internally? Um, I, again, I, I don't, any order, whoever wants to jump in first is fine. Steve, I think you hit it on the head that the, the air gap myth is, is, is a myth, right? And maybe there's a few organizations that have that. Have that. I, I doubt it, right? But the, the, the likelihood of these attacks, I mean, so what we use is, is a risk register to track it, you know, impact on one side and likelihood and on the other kind of thing. And, and as we do more and more of this tr digital transformation, obviously that likelihood goes up of a partner being breached or something like that, where, you know, something that's going to impact your organization, solar winds, because uh, you know, somebody like that. Um, so we, we really have to kind of balance that and adjust those likelihood scores kind of thing as they go up. And as things kind of move around on that risk register, you know, we know what we should be spending our time on because all of us are probably very resource constrained and, and trying to find out the most valuable things for our organizations to work on. And that's how we adjust. I would, I would kind of add from that, from a overall perspective of what we're seeing our customers, you know, from ServiceNow's perspective, we're starting to see this shift from, you know, engineering or automation, maintaining the technology on the shop floor to it becoming a centralized or standardized function that the CIO organization, CISO is now responsible for. Um, and because of that, it's requiring uh, kind of unified user governance across the models for which these are maintained. And I think that that provides a really unique opportunity in bringing together technology and pieces and capabilities that can really drive overall efficiency for an organization to see technology across the board, whether it's IT, whether it's OT, but seeing that intersection, right? There is possibility, the air gap's gone. There is possibility for an intersection or across, across the, the different boundaries and being able to have that, that unified view is very important. Very good. Hey, anything jump out at you, Fran? 
sorry. Um, I think absolutely, we certainly echo that. I mean, in the past, uh, our engineering teams typically run our plants, they ran independently, uh, that created that level of variation. We've made tremendous changes and transformational shifts in how we operate uh, IT within the manufacturing space. So uh, today, instead of each plant operating independently, we now have our IT groups, which coordinate that across our 130 manufacturing locations. We put in those standards, we put in that oversight, and now it's a collaborative effort um, to put in those IT systems that are secured, but also enable that um, remote access, if you will, that enable that transformational activity of, tra of transitioning data back and forth to them. So yeah, the old days of put in a system, set it and forget it, that's changed. And we've moved the organization along with that for both technically and organizationally. That's very good. I was, I'm thinking in terms of, of the, again, we, it's, it's different how you have to handle, you know, your, your, your risk formula, let's say is different. I, 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 Jeremy was talking about, you know, you have to tweak a little bit the likelihood and different stuff like this. Right. Um, it's, I'm trying to think of anecdotes, you know, pr from my own past. I remember, you know, there was times where certain types of risk, we didn't have to think about it all on the OT side. And, and there's, it's still that way. IT and OT, the, the actual main risks are a little different, but it just seems like now, with this uh, bridging these gaps and doing away with the, the luxury we had, I guess, of isolation. Um, to me, that's really changed the way we look at it. We try to use IT methodology and some of the ways it works fine and then other places it breaks down. We kind of have to at least keep more emphasis on it the way that it seems like it's working. Um, and, 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 when, and knowing that there's gonna be something, you're gonna have an increased chance of malware spread uh, in any kind of attack. You know. That's to me, asset management, again, knowing what you have, I'm, I'm going through in my mind, an actual scenario where we had an attack, we had logs that showed up in a SIM and nobody knew what this, this piece of equipment was. We didn't even know we had a log source for it at one place I worked. And we start digging and it took us like six panes of glass and 20 or 30 minutes just to figure out what, <laughs> what OT environment this was in. And then once we found it, it, it wasn't just as easy as pick up a phone and call somebody because there's no like, uh, you know, emergency phone number where we can get onto a line or something. So that to me, that, that asset visibility and being able to real quickly identify where something is geo, geo, you know, in the geo world, um, it, it's, it's something that you have to have. Um, okay. So with this, um, uh, with the increased exposure of critical assets, um, okay. I'm sorry, I just asked that. So having worked in plants, okay, here's another thing. You know, I, I, I've spent some time in a plant, multiple plants, and I've seen how busy everybody is. We're all busy. Everybody in IT and cyber, you know, we know how hard it is just to maintain this workload that we have, but it's a different kind of busy in plants because of the resource constraints, you know, with a lot of automation going on on the lines and, and stuff like that. You know, you don't have as many people that actually can run it. You don't have built-in redundancy and stuff. So I'm thinking about the resource constraints that are facing our OT workforces. And when you add the problem of cyber into their already busy schedule, how, how can we expect uh, them to keep up with the ever-changing targets and the threat, you know, uh, OT landscape? What are yeah, some I'll of jump, the key, keys? Yeah. I'll jump in on that one. I mean, that, that's kind of a change to the operating model that we have, you know, in, in, the, in the past, um, each plant was independent and ran its own thing. We're changing our operating model now to more of, a, of an enterprise model where we've got an enterprise SOC, which can go ahead and do that monitoring up front, take some of that workload off our plants so they can actually see across our sites and actually dispatch to our plants. So our plants don't have to focus on watching things all the time. We can have our enterprise SOC be kind of that first responder, which then takes our console data, that log data and dispatches it down into those facilities for actual execution and, and remediation if necessary. So that's one way we're trying to take some of that um, that workload off of our plant and operating teams. Yeah, we have a similar kind of thing where we have manufacturing engineers, you know, several dozen of them across different manufacturing lines, and they're all responsible for different parts and pieces. But we're kind of providing that holistic view, and you know, with with now having an asset visibility list, um, it was kind of hit or miss when you talk to the, one of the many dozens of you know manufacturing engineers. Like, do you have these devices? Do you not? And now we kind of have a single place to go and look, and and, and we're not bothering that, right? So we used to have to go around. We'd, right. we'd get a notification of a vulnerability or or some sort of question would come along, and you know, it would be reaching out to several dozen folks and, and getting a different kind of answer depending on that person 
and you know, with the resource constraints that they're having in their their OT space as well, some of those people change out. People who have been there for you know many years, you know, have retired or moved on to other things, kind of thing. And so now you have new people who have not has, doesn't don't have that historical context, and and just providing them with as much information as we can provide, and to try to stay out of their way, but also you know kind of educate them along the way of what's what's possible and and what they can do to help kind of thing and, and sometimes it's what you can do to help them as well and we're, what we're seeing from a lot of our customers is the emergence of um, you know escalating it from site level activities or site level best practices to overall best practices and what we call workflows across uh, those different types of organizations so best practices can be shared knowledge can be captured and actually institutionalized into you know, digital forms and digital platforms so that it can be reused, it can be accessed across the board. So we're starting to see a lot of that uh, take place where historically we've seen really site-based expertise or inside of the mind of, of specific individuals that uh, are, are maturing and retiring and leaving the organization. So being able to capture that institutional knowledge is really transformational in this. Very good. Yeah, it's it's obvious we have to change the way we work, and and, and that's don't you know we're brought into that with no no uh, other option. Um, you know, I like the idea of you know whatever they're doing in a plant right now. You know, it seems like all of cyber, even all of IT, is an analogy to the real world or to the non-digital world. Like we have a virus, you know, that we stole that from healthcare. You know, this type of stuff. But it seems like with you know whenever we work and we try to get a seat at the table within the plants. And, and the first thing they start, they start using really smart language about automation. Why can't you automate that? Well, you know, so they're, they're being, you know, being automation minded people and trying to all those years, you know, manage these gigantic physical processes with not enough people and not enough budget. They're, they're forcing us to think differently in IT and cyber. And so we have to start thinking about automation. We got to figure out how to streamline process and work, work in a different way that like you're talking about a, a newly designed workflow, new, new uh, uh, business models and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, I saw Peter posted that someone has a question. I, I like this question. It's a tough one. How do we position security as an enabler of digital transformation, not as a debt or a burden? It seems like, you know, for years, I've been trying to just get, you know, get there early in the cycle for projects and things and be able to, you know, incorporate cyber controls as a cost of doing business so they can calculate ROI in a smart way instead of after the fact trying to pick up the pieces and stuff. So how do we shift that mindset instead of just being, make sure that we show them the cost up front? How can we actually be, is it, or can we? I guess the question should start with, can we be an enabler of digital transformation? Or are we just always gonna be in a debt or a protector mode and just be a burden, a cost of doing business? I don't have an answer for that one. That's an that's a interesting spin, I like that. Anybody have something for that? Well, I mean, the way the way we look at that is is cybersecurity is an enabler because at the end of the day, um, when we're doing B two B activities, B two B transactions, our customers expect us to be a secure environment, a secure trading partner to to do business with. So we actually use cybersecurity as as a almost a marketing tool to say, hey, we've got our ducks in a row. We put cyber first. It's an integral part of what we do. So that enables our business uh, to conduct business with our with our partners, and that they look for that. I mean, I'm sure many organizations, just like us, their third parties are asking them about their cyber programs, and they're, you know, for a lack of a better term, auditing you. And if you don't meet the cut the mustard, um, they're gonna they're gonna shy away from you. So we see cyber as an enabler of growing our businesses. I completely agree. I think it's, it's a, it helps in the, the marketing space. The other area I've seen that it, it enables us is we work with a lot of smaller suppliers for things and, you know, maybe they don't have such a robust security team and, you know, we've had, you know, a supplier get their email hacked and send emails onto us that were, you know, not legitimate kind of thing. And so we've kind of helped some of our smaller suppliers along the way. And so we're helping them and that builds that strong relationship with our suppliers, which especially in today's age, having a good uh, supplier relationship is, has been really helpful for our organization to keep manufacturing products today. And I think talking to the point of kind of secure by design enables you to take technology steps where if you didn't have the security in place, you might not be trusted or be able to have that uh, type of connectivity ever be suggested, right? If it's not secure by design, it can't, it can't happen in the factory environment, across factory environments, or 
you know, even for us as a cloud provider, as communication to and from the cloud, right? Those have to be design principles that are started with. So that it's it's not not just an enabler, it's foundation, right? It's, it's even lower than enabling capability. It has to be built in for everything that's being done. So it's almost like if the cyber problem is, they can outsource that to us, you know, and we can handle that and, and they know that we got their backs, they can, they can continue pressing forward with business savvy and, and their innovation and stuff like that without without every step of the way having to stop and say, okay, what's what what could go wrong here? It's like as we get integrated integrated into their business processes, we get there early enough, we start building this this uh, environment where where uh, with technical controls where they can't do something wrong. I guess that kind of thing. That's a perfect scenario, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Any any other thoughts around that? And one other thing I'll add is um, I think I heard the term digital trust. That, that's a term we use. It, it's really cybersecurity enables you to build that digital trust with your suppliers, your trading partners, your customers. Um, you know, it's something that um, it, if it's not part of everything you do, I, I think you're going to probably be left in the path, left in the back of the pack. Very good. That's totally right in my mind. Um, so we're going to hear in this next section, we got a couple more questions on the panel time, but then we're going to hear from Jimmy Graham about, you know, the Dragos platform now provides OT specific vulner vulnerability management. I can't say that real fast. I have to slow down. Um, and thanks to the new integration with ServiceNow has recently released the OT management product. Um, we're going to talk about like this unified source of truth that we can present together with the OT, you know, the automatic OT asset discovery, and then it populates into ServiceNow. And then I'm thinking he's probably going to talk about, I haven't heard his presentation, but about the new hardware sensor options, this low, like rugged, low power, super portable DIN rail mounted sensor that we have. Um, so in light of these kind of new features, especially with the vulnerability management side is, is I think is something I kind of want to bring up here. Um, how do you think that these, these type of features in the Dragos platform would change the way that you do business and in, in your OT environment and the way that you manage risk and things like that? I'll jump in again uh, up front here. Um, couple of things come to mind. First of all, just the visibility, it, it, it changes the game and what we've done. Uh, we now have visibility across our sites. So again, that enterprise visibility, which allows us to correlate risks. You know, in the past, a site might see an event going on and it stayed at that site. Uh, today with, with our enterprise visibility, we can see events across sites, correlate that and proactively uh, take action uh, re regarding that. So that's that's one big piece of it. The other piece is when we talk about um, vulnerability management or, or, or prioritization, it allows us to focus on the highest risk assets that ha have the greatest vulnerability. So to focus our, our, our resources in the right places to address the key assets uh, with the biggest risks. You know, for my organization, you know, the, the asset of visibility is important, you know, so manufacturing has the statement of, you know, I can't manage what I can't measure. Well, I can't protect what I can't see. So if I don't know I have assets or I don't know what the vulnerabilities are in those assets. You know, that's going to make this entire, anything else you do is, is kind of, you know, shot, shot in the dark, right? So I, I know when I first saw the never next, never classifications, I was really pleasantly surprised how many, you know, now, nows I had, it was a small, very small handful of things to focus on. And that makes it a lot easier to go to my manufacturing engineers, my other team, and, and you know, we could focus on the few things rather than me being the boy who cried wolf on all the vulnerabilities that get posted. And it turns out, you know, a lot of those vulnerabilities are, you know, not all that impactful to an organization. And, and what Dragos has done there has been really, really helpful for us to kind of narrow in on what we should be looking at first. And, you know, obviously gives us the next for the, the next kind of set, but understanding what you have is the most important thing. If you don't have that, you won't get anywhere else. And from, from the ServiceNow side, we're, we're extremely excited around uh, the partnership and the integration with Dragos and the ability to really provide that, that unified view of all technology assets, right? This is a, you know, a great combination and great complement to uh, the ServiceNow capability in being able to provide that view as well as provide the vulnerabilities, right? And being able to integrate those and provide standard workflows uh, across the board now, whether it's IT, whether it's OT, uh, and giving CISOs or others unified dashboards of all the technology in their entire environment. This is something that our customers have requested, our customers have, have demanded, uh, and this partnership is really enabling us to get there. 
Very good. Yeah, it's it's you know, it's all about you know again how how do we manage our resources? What do we have? What's the most important priority? And if we if we don't have some view where we can figure out where the key uh, problems are that we attack, it won't be a risk based approach. It's almost just shooting in the dark if we can't pick the most important thing to attack at any given time. Um, so yeah, going going back to what James, what you were talking about. So how how I'm interested here, especially Fran Fran and uh, Jeremy. How does this kind of integration, how do you feel like this could help improve your operation? Having this new the integration, Drago service now, that type of thing. You have any thoughts about that? Yeah, yeah. for us, it comes back to kind of my earlier comment. It, it, it's going to allow us to, you know, there was a question in the chat here about what's most important, right? First thing, you have to know what you, what you have out there. So asset identification is key. And then these uh, capabilities to go out there and identify what your vulnerable assets are and then tie them back to, are they key assets in your organization? It's gonna be a game changer. It's gonna allow us to, we have finite resources, all of us, and it's gonna allow us to identify our assets, find the vulnerable ones and determine if they're on our critical systems or not. So that's what we think is gonna be our game changer in terms of refocusing our, our the re scarce resources we have. Yeah, I agree. So, you know, we have so many people in our organization, you know, they don't want yet another tool, tool or place or spreadsheet or email to go look. And so, you know, people are used to working in service now. And so the more information you can get into that single place, the place they know how to work to kind of tie all the pieces together, the more you integrate, the, the more efficient you can be and, and efficiency is key. Totally. Really like that. Okay. We just have a couple more minutes before we turn it over to Jimmy. I guess I'll just kind of, I took down a few notes while, I, while we were going here. It sounds like, you know, some, some recap, you know, the business case isn't maybe entirely done behind us and everything, but it's changed. Some of the arguments have changed that we have to take. We have a spectrum depending on the industry. A lot of it's getting baked in, but now our priorities are, are super important to get into the tactical weeds a little bit and try to justify um, what, what, what our shift is all about. Current major challenges I put, you know, new connectivity, new exposure. IT doesn't always fit. You can't take the IT way of thinking and always apply it directly into OT. So it's kind of forcing us into new operating models. Um, I, the business enabler question was cool. We were talking about, you know, that if if they if we can actually make that shift in thinking and become the business enabler, then where we have their back, you know, the business innovators can go out and do their jobs without having to always stop and, and consider us like a cost of doing business or, or somebody that drags them back or something. That's, that's a kind of a lofty goal, but it's something that you know, obviously we've got to strive for and not just being a cost center. Um, increased exposure is exacerbating the need for vulner vulnerability management and visibility. Uh, because now the thing, you know, we don't have this luxury anymore of, of the air gap and stuff. Now, automation is key. I put down and I said that the service now integration helps us to streamline that automation. Um, we know how scarce resources are. And if, if you have 10 panes of the glass, it's just impossible, let alone with if you have a flash worm or, you, you know, some of the stuff I'm going back to my own. I've done a lot of incident management in my career, you know, been, lived through a lot of this. And I know that uh, five minutes might take a might be a huge difference in and the amount of damage done. And then lastly, uh, the Dragos vulnerability management, improving operations, giving us that visibility that's critical and allowing us to focus on the most critical risks and, and change our program to be truly risk-based. So, hey, thanks a lot to y'all. I really appreciate your time today. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Jimmy now. Um, Steve, this is Peter. I'm just gonna jump in. And I do uh, also wanna thank our, our panelists, Jimmy, Fran, James, thanks for that, those insights. Steve Applegate, thanks so much, and way to go staying on time. And for a lot of the capabilities that you were hearing uh, that are needed, now we're going to turn it over to Jimmy Graham, who's the Senior Management of Product Management at Dragos, and uh, he's going to actually show you what, what these capabilities are. Okay, over to you, Jimmy. All right, thanks, Peter, and uh, thanks, Steve, and, and thank you, panelists. A really great discussion. All right, so... Um, just pop over here. So as, as Peter said, I'm Jimmy Graham, uh, Senior Director of Product at, at Dragos, and we're just going to dive into to talking about the platform. Um, so the, the Dragos platform is kind of that, that one place to provide um, asset visibility, um, kind of a unified place to, to find that inventory threat detections as well on top of that inventory. And then, of course, the question is, do I have the, we have the threat detections, what do we do with them? That's the investigation response where we have things like playbooks, and we'll drive into each one of these 
um, by the way. And then you've got the proactive measures as well. We've now introduced vulnerability management. So it's how do I find vulnerabilities in OT? You know, a lot of the traditional vulnerability management platforms are not designed to find vulnerabilities in OT. Um, so there, there's often a lot of gaps there. And that's one single platform that provides um, this end to end. We update all of that through, uh, through what we call our knowledge packs. Um, we call those knowledge packs for a reason because they, they don't just contain you know, things like IOCs. They do contain IOCs. They do contain um, you know, information on the latest threats, but they also contain the latest um, you know, threat intelligence and um, experience. Um, that's how we deliver our vulnerability management detection updates, how we deliver our guidance, our playbooks. Um, things that you can get directly from OT experts delivered directly into the platform. And all of that funnels up into um, our neighborhood keeper, uh, which is our collective de defense and community-wide visibility platform um, to provide context throughout the community. So it's not just, you know, siloed information. You know, obviously if, if customers want to uh, opt in and participate in that. Um, and then of course we've got, uh, if you look over off to the side here, we have this OT watch, which is our um, managed threat hunting and incident triage. Um, if you need some assistance in, in managing the, the platform and diving through those types of results. So we'll dive into a few of the use cases here, um, and then we'll, we'll pop into a, um, kind of a demo of the platform. So um, the, uh, we'll start with asset visibility. So um, there was a, a lot of talk about uh, the air gap myth, um, which, is, which was interesting, and that's, that's often true. That's often what's shown. Um, a lot of times, you know, you deploy um, our platform into a new environment. That's the first thing you notice where things are talking that we weren't expecting to be talking. Um, so we do provide that OT network traffic and assets. We show that um, not just the current state, not just what's talking now, but we show it historically. So we can tell you, we've got this nice little timeline slider, which you may be able to see in the screenshot there um, that lets you see, okay, what did it look like yesterday? What did it look like last week? You know, not just what's talking now. If you wanna look at what's talking now, you can do that as well. We also allow you to create zones um, flexibly. Um, so you can have zones that are either manually assigned where you say, okay, this asset's in this zone, or we can auto zone based on different, um, different types of attributes. Maybe it's device type, maybe it's location, uh, whatever makes sense in terms of organization, we can monitor traffic between those zones. Um, and then we're picking up a lot of different other asset details. So there's um, things that we're picking up directly off the wire, like the, the device type will automatically characterize it, the vendor firmware model information, all that information and the, the richer information we get then you know, the, the more detailed we can do in terms of vulnerability management and other things. But we also aren't just limited to what we can detect on the wire. Uh, plenty of OT protocols aren't, aren't putting out that information directly on the wire, um, but we can take uh, integrations from third parties to pull that information. And we can take um, imports from things like CSVs, manual inventories, whatever you have, we can use to augment um, our asset inventory because uh, I think it was said, um, on the call earlier by, by Jeremy, you can't protect what you can't see. So really the foundation of everything is, is making sure that you have this, this proper asset visibility. Um, I'm trying to try to move to the next slide. There we go, okay. So then once you have that asset visibility, you know we also monitor, well, I'm thinking, I think there may be a little bit of a delay. Um, Peter, if you can just go back one slide. I think I got it. So we should be on the threat analytics slide. Okay, so we have our threat analytics. It's baked into the platform. This is where we do our continuous threat monitoring. Um, everything that we detect, we're going to map to MITRE ATT&CK. You know, so a lot of times MITRE ATT&CK is, is um, what everyone's focused on right now in terms of narrowing down what is a specific tactic, um, technique, and so on. Um, every alert that we put into that platform is going to have MITRE ATT&CK uh, assigned to it. You can build a dashboard that um, shows you kind of a heat map of, you know, here's the various different tactics and techniques um, that, are, that we see in this environment. Of course, um, we provide um, not only our severity ranking, and we do not inflate our severity, by the way. If we say something is a severity five or four, then that is a big deal um, to see in an environment. Um, you're not going to see everything come through as a four or five like you see in, in some types of IDS platforms. Um, and then once you have that, those uh, threat analytics, of course, like I said before, the question is, what do we do with them? So we have built into the platform case management. We also have um, the, we have built in playbooks. So we have OT experts that take a look at the various different alerts that we can trigger and we assign playbooks to those. So we can tell you exactly how to handle what to do with this. And of course that can be customized and edited so you can pull in 
um, that institutional knowledge. Uh, James talked about institutional knowledge um, that, that may be important to add to it. Where it's like, if we see this type of event, this is the way we want to handle it. Um, and then we also provide our step-by-step -step guides um, on how to further dig into um, that specific event um, to gather more information um, if necessary. And that's all um, written, that's all, that's all deployed through our knowledge packs. Um, and of course, we also have our vulnerability management. So this is um, a newer feature that we've added to the platform. This is purpose-built OT vulnerability management. This is not a rebranded other vulnerability detection engine. This is not an IT-focused vulnerability management solution. This is specifically built for OT. So it uses our vulnerability knowledge base. So it uses our own expert information uh, and guidance around vulnerabilities um, that we add in here. So we're, you know, while we do import um, things like CVSS score and, and um, uh, you know, things like that from ICS CERT and NVD, we're not reliant on that information. In fact, we correct the CVSS score and have a Dragos corrected CVSS score for when we see that um, it's, it's the wrong score. Um, but on top of that, we provide our own guidance. We give it a risk level. And again, we don't inflate risk levels. Um, this is provided, these risk levels are provided by OT vulnerability experts who say, you know what, this is not a big deal. It might have a high CVSS score. That does not mean it's something that's a high risk level. And then we boil that all down to a very simple now, next, and never. Uh, is this something you need to address now? Is this something you need to schedule for later and address next? Or is this something you're never going to do? And we'll dive into that a little bit more um, in a minute. So, um, In terms of platform deployment, um, we have a lot of different options. Whoops, we're having a little bit of issues with the slides. All right, so in terms of platform deployment, um, we've got our Drago site store. I think if you can, uh, Peter, if you can get me back to the platform deployment page. Jimmy, you still have control. My apologies for that. If you can just back up. That's fine. Okay, hopefully it'll, hopefully it'll stay put. Um, so we have our, our site store. That's where everything, um, you know, that's where everything is, is collected. Um, that can be an on-prem deployment. We can do AWS cloud deployment. Um, for, for the managed hunting, obviously that can come out to our cloud. Um, we do traffic collection through various different sensors. I have another slide, which you got a little bit of a sneak peek on um, the, with different um, form factors for um, collecting traffic that includes virtual and others. Um, we can also pull in logs and PCAPs. So you're not just limited to live traffic collection. You can pull a PCAP and run that through the system as well. Um, you can take logs from things like Windows devices. We can consume that um, and, and actually detect threats directly from those Windows event logs. Um, and then we've got a lot of different integrations and I have a slide on that as well. So I'm gonna click just one time. All right, it worked. Um, so in terms of our, our sensors, again, we, we do passive collection. You know, so we're not going out and, and causing disruption um, in the OT environments. We're doing passive collection. We have multiple form factors um, that we have today. So. Um, we have our ruggedized uh, DIN rail option, which is fanless. It's um, you know wall mount mountable. It's rated for high temperatures and so on. Um, specifically designed for those different um, environments that you're likely to be in. We also have an SEL um, device, which is commonly deployed. Most of you are probably familiar with the SEL devices. That is also rugged. It's industrial rated. Be deployed pretty much anywhere. Um, and then we also have, you know, a couple other options as well as virtual sensors. So this is something that we can do virtually as well. Um, in terms of integrations, um, we have a lot of different integrations from integrating with a firewall to um, implement firewall rule changes based on um, guidance to CMDB integrations, um, integrations with uh, historians to pull in asset information. We talked already a little bit about our service now integration. I have another slide on that we'll talk about. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so this is one way to, to not only get things like um, asset information in and out of the platform, but it's also like event data. Um, so we talked about um, enterprise SOC, a lot of this information needing to be delivered to the enterprise SOC. We have a lot of different integrations into SIM tools to make sure that that can happen. And uh, now we're just going to give you a brief overview of the platform uh, to just walk through one of the use cases in terms of asset um, visibility. So we collect a lot of information on assets. You can see here we've got a, um, you know, a network switch. Um, we'll give you information like the first time we saw it, the last time we saw it. You can set a Purdue level. Um, we'll automatically classify it with class and type, um, determine whether it's in baseline or not. If you scroll down in this page, 
you'll see um, we pull in all the different hardware information, um, hardware vendor series, whatever we can collect off of it. Again, either something that we're picking up off the wire, something that you've manually input or in, imported through an integration. Um, we pull in network address information, IP addresses, MAC addresses, host names, again, everything that, that we can see to, to bring relevance to this asset, um, as well as custom attributes. So there is some talk about, you know, we don't know who the system owner is. Um, you can assign any attribute to, to any asset. So that's one way to track that, um, to make sure that there's, um, hey, who is the system owner for this? We need to track it down. So you're not trying to, you know, find that in another system, it's directly here. And of course, we've got the zone, uh, which we can manually assign like you see here, but you don't have to manually assign it. It's something you can create a rule for. So you can kind of set it up and now everything's automatically zoned into the right location. So you can monitor traffic between those zones. Um, and then within a given asset, we have other information like communication data, notifications. That's the, the alerts that we find through our threat detections, vulnerabilities. And we'll dive into a couple of those right now. So if you look at the notifications tab, you'll see um, where we find different notifications and we'll give you a summary of what we found. You can obviously dive into this, open a case on it. We'll give you that severity. And again, we don't inflate those severities. These are realistic severities. Um, so you're not looking at fours and fives every single day. Um, and then from a vulnerability standpoint, um, we'll give you all the vulnerabilities on that um, specific device. So you can also go to our vulnerability um, management tab and that'll show you all the different vulnerabilities across the entire enterprise. For this one, we're looking at this one asset. You can see we've got different things like our risk level of prioritization, our confidence rating, when's the first time we found the vulnerability, when's the last time we found the vulnerability, what asset is it on and so on. And we'll give you information about um, other ones. So we'll pull open that specific vulnerability and if you look here, you'll see all of that high level information about the volume. What's the priority? Is it a now, is it a next, is it a never? Uh, what's this risk level? What's the confidence Dragos has in that vulnerability? We assign multiple confidence, uh, confidence scores um, specifically to, to make sure that, that you know we've collected enough information to have a high confidence that this vulnerability is there. Um, if we've only been able to collect a little bit of information, we don't know the firmware, we know the, the model, that might be a, a lower confidence value, but that's something you can easily filter on and pivot on. Uh, within the platform. And again, we have the, the CVSS base score, the corrected CVSS and so on. We'll pull in asset information. And then kind of the focus of this is the Dragos guidance. So we'll tell you, hey, there's no patch for this. There's a vulnerability that's announced, there's no patch. And a lot of times the vendors don't provide guidance, but we'll provide that guidance and say, hey, you just need to disable Telnet. Um, you need to disable uh, this access to TCP port 23. And you're actually good with this vulnerability. And not only will we give you that guidance, We'll show you, hey, nothing's talking to that port. So maybe that's something you can close. Um, so we do track state. This is not just vulnerability assessment, it is vulnerability management. So you can close that as mitigated, or you can risk accept it, close it as remediated, uh, whatever makes sense for this. In this case, we're going to say, okay, well, the ACL has been modified to deny access to it. So we're going to close it as mitigated. We don't need to deploy a patch. There is no patch to deploy. Um, and that's basically how we handle that. So I know that was quick. Of course, you can reach out to us. We'll give you um, deeper demos into all the areas of the platform. So um, now I just wanna, before we wrap up, I'll talk about the ServiceNow integration since we hit on that a little bit. Um, this is a direct integration from, um, from Dragos into ServiceNow. Um, so this is ServiceNow's OT manager. Uh, we provide asset visibility and asset discovery uh, for those OT and ICS. Everything IT is already in ServiceNow. So why not put all the OT assets in there? Um, we use a service graph connector, which is the, the latest, greatest technology from ServiceNow. Um, we do support things like mid-server, so you're not having to worry about all of your OT environment talking directly to the cloud. We can talk through that mid-server to make sure that um, everything's secure for that asset information. So everything that we discover is now uh, can just be in ServiceNow. That includes all the deep hardware information that we talked about, the, the firmware, the vendor, the model numbers, everything. Um, and then, of course, coming soon, we touched on this a little bit. Uh, we'll have vulnerability response for OT. So you probably already have, if you have ServiceNow, um, you're probably pulling your vulnerabilities in there from your IT vulnerability management solution. Now you can have vulnerability management across OT. That's OT, OT specific into one platform. And then of course, we'll also add on to that security incident response. So while we do have case management in our platform, it may make sense to centralize that um, enterprise wide and say, we're gonna do case management. We're gonna do IR um, all from ServiceNow. We'll plug into that and make sure that all the different notifications and events that, that we see, all the different threats that we detect are pushed directly into ServiceNow. Um, and with that, I, I think I'll, I'll pass it uh, back to Peter. Thank you, Jimmy, that was terrific. And thanks to our panelists. Um, and um, just to 
provide some additional information and resources for attendees. Uh, we've, we've got a lot of great assets. Um, I did put at the top here, we have a, a really great new video that shows how the Dragos platform actually works in the Dragos in, in the Deloitte Smart Factory, which I'd encourage you to check out. It's it's terrific. Um, and then more substantive assets that you can actually use to kind of improve your understanding, help with internal awareness around a lot of the issues here. An executive's guide to industrial cybersecurity. We have a, a threat perspective specific to manufacturing and terrific white papers, in-depth white papers on how you do vulnerability management, the right approach um, using the Dragos platform as well as uh, asset management. And of course, we'd love to show you this capability directly and in person. If you'd like to schedule a demo and see this stuff firsthand, you can just send us a, uh, a request uh, using that link below. So with that, uh, I want to thank our, our panelists, uh, Steve, our moderator, Jimmy Asher from uh, Deloitte for giving us an overview of the Smart Factory. Thank you to everyone. Thanks for attending and goodbye.